Got you. <laughs> Aloha, welcome to Condo Insider. It's Thursday at 3 p.m. And we're going to have a very vibrant discussion today, primarily because of some recent actions our legislature took with regard to condominiums. And I like to say this show is about to go up in smoke. And I say that because we're going to talk about smoking and what the rules are and what the proposed legislation is. And I brought in a very good friend of mine, Tim Epicella, who has sponsored shows here, or been a host of a show here, who's... Uh, I thought he was smarter than this, but he served on board members, owns in condos, general manager of a condo. You, you have condos in your blood. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for having me. And I'm glad you said it. you thought I was smart enough. <laughs> Apparently, I'm not. <laughs> well, my friends always say, I say to them, I'm smarter than I look. And they say, that's true. No one can be that dumb and look that stupid, you know. <laughs> but Stop. anyway, back to the show. Tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got to Hawaii, what you do in general. Well, I came here about 11 years ago, and, um, you know, I've always been involved in condominium boards. I always believe that if you're an owner, you get engaged in the community in which you live. That's always been my, my modus operandi from the first condo I bought in 1991, I think. Uh, it's way back in the day, and I've always been involved in the boards and, and governance and, and trying to maintain and enhance the value of the, the buildings that you live in and invest in. And, so it just took a natural course from that. So I've been on board for over 23 years, and I certainly did my own building management. Um, this property in Seattle was over the water. It was more of a ship than it was a condo, so I took care of that building for many, many years. And, you know, there's a lot that goes into the care and maintenance of a building. Well, I'm going to ask you this question. I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this question before we go into smoking. You know, we at the legislature see a lot of advocates come out and talk about how bad the boards are and how incompetent and self-serving. Has that been your experience in general? A small minority are self-serving, a very small minority. And I think those days are going away. I think there's more uh, emphasis on um, education of board members, what their fiduciary responsibilities are, what their roles are, why are they there in the first place. And I think the days of board members or people getting on the board to serve their own purpose, I think those days are going away. I saw it very much in the, you know, in the 90s and you know, some part of the early 2000s, but I don't see that so much anymore. I, I think most people who serve on the board are dedicated, and they want to see their investment grow, and they want to take care of the building in which they live. Well, I think today we're going to talk about smoking. I do want to say one thing we didn't mention with regard to your background. You're on the board of the Hawaii Council Community Associations. You're also on the Legislative Action Committee for Community Association Institute. So you certainly demonstrated your interest in our industry, and we thank you for that. Well, thank you, Richard. Because it takes interested people to uh, do the changes you've talked about, that the uh, associations are getting better and stronger with their boards. But let's kind of review, from your perception, the issue of smoking. You know, there's always the smokers and non-smokers, and there's always one against the other. What's your understanding of the current law and with regard to condos and their rights to address smoking? Well, my understanding is that if an association feels that smoking is de detrimental to other residents, that they do have the right to uh, initiate a change to the bylaws. Um, now, that's not to say that's an easy thing to do. We, we know changing the bylaws takes a lot of time and a lot of organization and sometimes a lot of money to pay for attorney's fees and opinions and the actual legal documents. Um, but it's something that I think all associations have the right to do. And when it comes to smoking, um, certainly on a generic sense about ethics is my, my rights and responsibilities stop where yours rights and responsibilities start. And when it comes to smoking in, in a tight you know, quarters of you know, you, people living next to each other in close, you know, in close quarters, I think those rights have to be very much looked at. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, taking one step backwards even on that matter. Today, state law says you can't smoke in the common elements, period. Number two is the debate over the lanai's because sometimes the declaration makes the lanai an apartment, sometimes it's a limited common element. Then you get in this issue of noxious odors, whether it be smoke or uh, some foreign food you're cooking on your lanai that causes, or incense, you know. But lanai's has always been a debate within the industry about that issue, depending whether it's a limited common element or apartment, et cetera. And then there is always, the, within the apartment, that if it's not otherwise specified in the bylaws, you have a right to smoke, period. And there's nothing the board can do about it unless they change the bylaws. And that's, that's kind of the framework where we're going to begin. Do you think right. that's a fair assessment? Of yes, I think that's fair. Um, 
again, I, I, I really think that, um, you know, there is, it's, it's a balance because, you know, at what point if I'm doing a, a completely legal activity within the confines of my own unit and is not adversely affecting any other resident, does an association have the right to tell me I cannot? Um, you know, we talked, I have, I have this feeling that, you know, associations per se are not legal governments, but in a, in a, in a sense, they are governments. And so to what point does a, and a government have the right to tell me that a legal activity that I've been doing all my life or maybe, you know, whatever, is suddenly now um, forbidden and, and to be prohibited? So that's, you know, it's a fine balance on this. Yeah, and I understand the issues. I mean, and as we were chatting before the show began, I'm one of these strange people who've never even tried a cigarette before. But I do know I can tell when there's secondhand smoke because my eyes water and I don't want to say I'm allergic, but certainly I'm, I'm sensitive to the secondhand smoke. And there's certainly tons of articles written about uh, the damage of secondhand smoke. I'm going to say if that's prevalent in your life. I'm to, so we understand those issues. But as I said to you before the show began, well, if it's so bad, why don't they just ban cigarettes altogether? You know, I mean, if they're going to allow them and say they're legal, now you have groups pitted against each other with respect to that. But going back to my next question is going to be, all right, we know that limited common elements are debatable in the eyes. We know the common elements, absolutely boards can enforce no smoking. And you mentioned it briefly. If they want to make it a non-smoking building, if the majority of the owners there want to make it a non-smoking building, under the current belief and the current laws, everyone believes it takes a vote, an affirmative vote, of 67% of the owners to change the bylaws to be non-smoking. And you've had experience with that. I have. And, and uh, the building that I am a board member of as well in Waikiki, um, back in 2015, it came up as an issue. Uh, it actually came up as a, in the, at the annual meeting. And some people, you know, voiced a concern about secondhand smoke. And it just caught traction. And before you knew it, we were in the process of changing the bylaws. Um, was there a public process? Um, not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. Um, other than the open board meetings where it was being discussed, there weren't you know, special sessions you, to identify who were smokers and who weren't smokers of that, of that complex. So, so <clears throat> at these board meetings, were they contentious at all? Or? No. No. And I think what you're seeing in the population over the decades is that you know, there are very few smokers. Um, it was, there are just not a whole lot of smokers. So Jumping ahead a little bit, um, when the final vote was taken, when we finally got to 67%, which, by the way, took a year, it took, it took a full year to get to that point, um, it was 10% were opposed to it because, presumably, they were smokers. Um, I voted no against it because I just didn't feel that, you know, a legal activity should be prohibited by an association as long as it's not aff adversely affecting your, your re fellow residents. Yeah, the way I kind of look at this is that, because I would tell you I'm not a, a fan of smoking. Neither that right. being said, I understand the argument on the lanai's because you really are putting yourself in a position that the, it's likely that secondhand smoke is going to uh, uh, go to another apartment. But within their own private unit, I don't know how you can say to someone this legal activity because you're allowed to buy cigarettes today. Yeah, I, I, I. I suffered that dilemma as far as going back and forth. As a board member, we're trying to pass this, but as a as a homeowner as well, I had to you know weigh the counterbalance to that argument, and I was I was conflicted. So you guys passed the bylaw amendment, say you're a non-smoking building. We did. So what did you do with the smokers? Well, that's that's an interesting point. We actually had to partake in a evaluative mediation, which is you know something near, near and dear to your heart. By Act 187, one of my favorite things. <laughs> That's right. Um, and that was a particular case where someone had purchased into the building, um, apparently wasn't aware that this process was going on. You know, to change the bylaw, it takes time. You know, right. it takes a year, but you're, even before that, you're still working through, you know, getting legal opinions and things of that nature. So all in all, it was at least a year and a half. So he had purchased somewhere in that time frame and then said, what do you mean you've changed the bylaws? I'm a two-pack-a-day smoker. And uh, so we did go to mediation, and ultimately the association prevailed because in our minutes, these things were being discussed. Um, when he bought the unit to begin with and his certificate you know, of disclosure, um, it was mentioned that uh, you know, in the minutes that uh, we're going through this process of prohibiting the smoking. I'm going to say this, and you know, even though I'm old, my recollection is usually pretty good. 
is that there was actually a lawsuit going back a few years ago where an association changed its rules from smoking to no smoking throughout the whole building. And the judge ruled in that case is that when you're buying a condo, you realize that they're self-governing and that the owners control what the rules are going to be. And you take that risk when you're buying a condo. It may not be the same if the majority of the owners are in some cases a supermajority, like 67 percent. Uh, can change these rules, and that's a risk you take when you buy an Interesting. Was that a Hawaii state law, or is that mainland, somewhere in the mainland? No, that was a Hawaii case. Is that right? It, was, it goes back in the early stages, because uh, a lot of condos, I shouldn't say a lot, uh, a number of condos have become non-smoking, uh, and a number of condos have considered it, abandoned the idea for similar reasons that you stated, you know, but... Uh, back to my question on the smoker. So you have a non-smoking building now. What are you doing to enforce it? Well, Richard, there's not only the $64,000 question, but a whole lot more than that. Um, I, I, I see it's almost impossible to enforce unless you directly witness someone uh, with a door open and you see them smoking. But if that door is closed, um, you know, how do you enforce that? You, you have no legal rights to enter unless there is a maintenance emergency. Um, you know, all it takes is someone to say, don't, they don't even answer the door. So, I mean, well, the, the board or the resident manager goes along the hallway. He thinks he smells smoke. They don't open the door. And he says, I think you smell smoke in there. And he says, I'm using a smoke flavored aerosol can as my, my, uh, uh, take away the smell of the kitchen cooking, you know. I would yell through the door, you're nose blind, go away. <laughs> so, you know, um, how do you prove some, a, a smell that cannot be, you know, exactly proven unless you verify it? You can't. Uh, was there, did your board ever consider, like, having a, um, a smoking area uh, where the smokers could go or saying to the smokers, we're giving you three years to <clears throat> kick the habit? Or? Well, yes, that was discussed when it came to this mediation. Um, they thought, well, maybe... We can have a, a place behind the pond, behind the rocks, <laughs> against the next property as mitigation for this, this dilemma. And ultimately, the board just said, no, we, we passed it. We, not only is it on you know, all the common area, but it's also inside the unit. And that's what we're sticking to. So an unintended consequence of our passing, or amending the bylaws about no smoking in the unit, is now the sidewalk becomes smoker's haven. And so we have a number of residents who are out on the sidewalk in front of the property, and that's where they're conducting their vaping or their smoking. And what an image that is. I mean, is that, is that something that you know, the association wants to have as a, a visual for the property? And the answer, in my opinion, is not really. Well, it's interesting. I had a property on Kauai that passed no smoking for the building, but they decided to do the opposite and create a uh, smoking area so the residents could not smoke in the units, not smoke on the knives, not smoke at the pool. We do have a smoking area, and they put it right next to the trash compactor. Really? <laughs> really? So it wasn't exactly the most <laughs> desirable place. But believe it or not, people used it. But it seems to me we're creating uh, an environment of smoker versus non-smoker where you have people who are addicted when it's something that's lawful. When I think that is the operative word, addictive. Um, what do you say to those smokers that are addicted? And remember, quitting cigarettes is just as hard as anything else. In fact, times nicotine is harder than a lot of other addictions. So what do you say to someone who is, is completely addicted, and all of a sudden you're saying, thou shall not smoke inside your unit? Well, I know I'm addicted to red wine. But I tell people, <laughs> I listen to people on wine all day long. I drink red wine all night long. I only have one glass. But anyway, we're going to take a short break and come back and talk about what our legislature is doing about this. We'll be right back in a minute. Aloha and welcome to At the Crossroads. I'm your host, Keisha King. You can catch me every Wednesday, alive at five. I'll see you there. Aloha, this is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at 3, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in, and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there, and we have an awesome 
a studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. Welcome back to Condo Insider with my good friend Tim Epicella talking about how to keep, uh, I guess, a project from going up in smoke, or I should say smoking. You know, we had some brief discussions about the current rules, and we talked about the efforts it takes to amend the bylaws, but the one where we didn't mention was marijuana. So if you're a non-smoking building, from your understanding, can you prohibit someone from smoking marijuana? Well, in the case of the condo that I'm a board member on in Waikiki, um, this we, we were grappling with this before the state actually did pass the, the medical marijuana uh, bill. So, you know, we had the argument is if, if I have a license, you know, a, a medical marijuana license, um, doesn't that allow me the freedom to do so? Because to say you can't smoke in your unit, you have to go out on the street, by de facto, you're defining me as breaking the law because you're not allowed to smoke marijuana in public. So if you can't do it inside your unit, where are you supposed to smoke your medical marijuana? Yeah, and on our show, it's an interesting argument because the, the lawyers and people we've had on our show have all said that if you're a non-smoking building, you can't smoke marijuana because there's other ways to ingest marijuana, whether it be, I guess, in a brownie or uh, through an IV needle or whatever. You're not saying they can't use marijuana. You're saying there's no smoking whatsoever. And right. That would be uh, the common industry practice is if you have a non-smoking building, you can't smoke marijuana. That doesn't mean you can't grow your certain number of plants or you can't take it through other sources. Well, that's the other sources, I think, is the solution, is that you, there's other ways of getting the, uh, the benefits of cannabis into your yeah. bloodstream than other through inhalation. And um, that's the secret right there. And subject to the lawyers who all have told me they're smarter than I am, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, we sh you should put it in the house rules, probably, that if you have a non-smoking building, this applies also to some kind of disclosure. But let's talk a little bit about, you know, we get this almost every year, but we have two bills that are still alive in the legislature today. And I wanted to get your take on them. Well, first off, they've made it this far. Now, usually they don't even make it this far. So what do you think the difference is in this session versus previous sessions? Why is this gaining more traction with legislators? Well, I think it's been the last two years anyway they've had this come up and, and they haven't gone very far. But... Um, I think it's just they're continuing to pound on the desk and make this an issue, the, the, uh, these health organizations. And I'm not saying they're wrong in their opinion, but they're making it a, a bigger cry. And let's, let's face it, probably 10 to 15 percent of the population is smokers. 85 percent are not, in my example. Correct. The supermajority is going to say, I don't want smoking because otherwise they'd be smokers, right? Right. So the odds are stacked against the non-smokers in some respect. But Let's look at what the legislature said they want to do. The first, first of all, they were companion bills. They came in with the same stated purpose. The first one in the, in the House basically says two things, and I want to get your take on it. Number one, that the board, not the homeowners, the board can set up a House rule and say, one, that the House rule says that if you rent your unit out, not that you live there, you rent it, you're an investor owner, the board can mandate you putting in your private lease rental agreement. You have to put a non-smoking provision in your private rental agreement. The second part was it gives the board the right to declare and uh, make a house rule no smoking on the lanai's. So what's your take on that? Um, my take is it's one before the other. Is it's, you know, um, there's a, maybe a priority, and that is no smoking on the lanai's because it's a common area. And two, again, if, if the building's saying there's not going to be smoking inside the unit, then I think they have the right to enforce a provision that prohibits landlords from placing a smoker into the unit. This, this is, for me, it's black and white. Yeah. You know, the industry, uh, in our p official position is we're monitoring the bills because you know, the legislature is like a sausage factory. What goes in is not and, what comes out. And you don't want to watch it in process. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so the, the bill, when it came in, uh, had this intended purpose, and the first thing that rose our, to our attention is, was that discriminatory to have a tenant can't have the same privileges? Because there's fair housing laws, right? Correct. And there's, there's restrictions against having different rules for tenants 
than you have for owners. Right. And, and that's fair housing federal law. Right. So the first thing that rose to our attention was, well, how does this fit into the fair housing laws? Where everybody's kind of saying, well, an eyes kind of makes sense to uh, solve that argument. And remember I said it's like a sausage factory? Right. The same bill went into the Senate. And you know what they did? They didn't take that bill. They amended it that the board as a whole can make it a non-smoking building without the vote of the owners. Without the vote of the owners? Yes. Oh, I have issues with that. Oh, very much so I have issues with that. I mean, I, I would really like to see a, the 67% adopt a vote. Yeah, well, see, here's the issue to me on this. So this year's board votes for no smoking. Next year's board votes for smoking. The following year board votes for no smoking. Uh, well, talk. that's 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 the dilemma of a house rule provision versus a declaration provision. That's right. So I'm saying if they give the board that authority, so what happens if I'm a person I sign a lease because it's a smoking building and I go in there and two months later a new board gets elected and they make it a non-smoking building? I mean, it seems discriminatory on its face. Yeah. But then in the next year, because I'm unhappy, happy, the board shifts and, and now it's a smoking building or a non-smoking. It goes back and forth. Well, if I'm the landlord, I'm going to have a provision in my new lease <laughs> stating the board may change things that are not mentioned in this lease. But and my know? question, does it affect housing? Are we, are we making it more difficult or easier to do rentals and get rental housing if we put restrictions that make it more difficult? So where are the smokers going to go? to get housing if, in fact, everybody takes that rule and the supermajority are already non-smokers. And how does that all fit into this whole thing? You don't ask easy questions at all. <laughs> so these are tough ones. No, it makes these me are... want to become a lawyer. They're going to make all the money on sure. this whole damn thing. Absolutely. You know, it's a, it's... As ours did <laughs> to yeah. help us amend the bylaws. So, you know, I think we have to be cautious. Now, I would be, to answer your question clearly, we just finished what's called first decking. That means if the bill is not in the final committee, that means it's dead. Well, of the 40 bills that got introduced this year, there's maybe 15 left now, of which two of them are these smoking bills, of which if you go back, there was another bill in the House that had the identical language and the House deferred that bill. But it doesn't mean they deferred it for any reason. They made us new, well, we'll deal with it in the House bill um, 810, 810, as yeah. our vehicle bill, as we call it. Well, right. we'll defer that one because we're going to deal with the issue. You're going to do it on the Senate uh, bill, probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and one of those. So I don't think anyone really knows where this is going to go. But right. I think it's going to create issues where we're pitting in the, in, the, in the ownership or the occupancy of the residency, smokers versus non-smokers. I think, I think the, non, the, the smokers will feel alienated. And I think in our case, you know, three years ago, um, those smokers were feeling alienated. They feel like second-class citizens. They're on the sidewalk right now. Um, they may or may not throw away their cigarette butts in a receptacle versus on the sidewalk. You know, um, there's, you know there's indirect protests sometimes, and, and we witnessed that. Uh, again, that's one of the unintended consequences of passing this years ago. What, what do you see, the, putting this in a more strategic perspective, the social implications of this whole thing. Well, I, I really do see this very much as if it were a helmet law for motorcycles. I see it very much, uh, very similar to the uh, don't walk with a cell phone, you know, don't look at your cell phone when you're crossing the crosswalk here that was passed last year in uh, Honolulu. Um, these are bills that if you really look at the, the, uh, the cause effect is, what is the society's cost as a whole for health care? And how much um, does it cost in an ER for someone who doesn't wear a helmet, who has now a, you know, a devastating head trauma? How many hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical costs are incurred because of the irresponsibility of someone who wants to ride a motorcycle without a helmet? Um, again, from the motorcycle's perspective, hey, it's my life, it's my freedom, and don't tell me, don't be a nanny state and tell me how to live my life. But from a societal point of view, when we all have to have shared health cost experience, that's when you start seeing these kind of laws. Even back in the early days, seatbelt laws and you know, things of that nature. So if I was going to propose a law that if you're a smoker, you would sign an indemnity agreement against the health insurance, the state of Hawaii, and everyone else, that you're taking the risk of smoking, and I won't come to you for my health care costs. Indemnity and hold harmless. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, <laughs> that's what you need to do. You know, because I don't see a way around because... Uh, you brought up the cell phone bill. I mean, 
I'm sure you see every day people walking across the street using their, their cell phones, both in the car as well as in the crosswalk. So it, that gets back to how enforceable is it? You well, and, and why is this coming to be? Um, is it really the dangers of secondhand smoke when you smell a whisper of, of smoke that might be coming through your vent? I, it, it may be, but is it the carcinogenic exposure that is, you know, the real hazard of secondhand smoke on a prolonged basis? I don't know. So does that mean you're going to run from governor and I can vote for you and you'll solve all these problems? Governor of an island we don't even know the name of. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> well, anyway, we're on Condo Insider talking about the challenges of smoking. We've discussed the current rules, the current practices. If you want to be a non-smoking building, you need 67% of the owners to vote affirmatively for it. The legislature is kind of messing around with this a little bit, trying to say, well, let's let the board make the decision, which will create all sorts of hidden problems and conditions, but we'll see where that goes in the legislature. And I want to thank my guest, Tim, for being on the show. Thank you, Richard, very much you're, for having me. Appreciate a, it. You're a wonderful guy. I've got to know you really well over the last 10 years or more, and uh, I thank you for all you do in the industry. Thank you, thank you very much. We thank our audience for watching Condo Insider. Next week, we're going to talk about the legislature again and proxies and who you can give your proxy to, because now certain groups don't want you to have the right to give proxies to whoever you want to give them to. They want to steer by the proxy itself and take away choices. So we'll talk about that next week with Steve Lanstein. Aloha, and thank you for watching Condo Insider.